Well, take your Bibles, if you would, and let's return to the narrative of Luke 15, where we have been hearing from the Lord Jesus Christ on really what so far has been a riveting, riveting subject. As you know, he is expressing the heart of God himself because he is talking to crowds of people wherein there is unbelief from a variety of backgrounds and uh, wrong perspectives and errant views. He also has in the crowd some who we might say are at the worst stage of unbelief, the worst kind of unbelief, religious unbelief. In fact, Jesus is so pointed in this story of the prodigal that we dare not miss the lesson of it. Sometimes we read the story of the prodigal son and of course it has the wonderful reality of the grace of God reaching out to someone who has messed up his life so poorly. This, this we resonate with as our friends uh, experience the mercy of God in the gospel, as family members are told the grace of the gospel. We, we resonate immediately with that, but we dare not miss the reality that there's one particular group of people, one kind of unbelief for which this story has maximum impact and confrontation. We're speaking, of course, of none other than the religious proud the spiritually proud. It is the number one soul killer. It is the ultimate soul killer, pride, but particularly spiritual pride. Because the spiritually proud can never know the grace of God. They can never know it. It is the one thing that keeps them from the truth of the gospel. To imagine oneself good enough, to imagine that God is low enough and will wink at evil and corruption, to imagine that you could climb your way to acceptability before God, or to imagine that God will merely turn a blind eye to the guilty. This is the deadliest sin of all. It is the very first and original sin committed against the holy God by his creatures. And it is, of course, the ongoing corrupt part of our hearts that devastates humanity. This is it, spiritual unbelief, pride that pretends to know God and yet never admits one's sin. That's who the parable is ultimately for. And you remember that in this parable, there, there is, of course, every conceivable dynamic going on in the minds of those who are hearing it. Jesus tells the story in such concise words, but in that economy of words is the genius of the divine mind and heart to touch every issue that needs to be touched. He talks here about a son that would be arrogant, foolish, and foolhardy and ignore the common graces that have been bestowed on his life. And he asks for all the resources he can have that are his and he is given them. And you know he goes out and does what, what the flesh will inevitably always do. He will go the way of all flesh. He, in the story, squanders all that he'd been given, all that had been bestowed upon him freely, he took it and he squandered it in selfish, foolhardy living, seeking pleasure for pleasure's sake, boasting of it as though it were a reflection of his being the captain of his own soul. And he found out what everybody finds out when you run into uh, a love of those things. The inevitable end of it comes and it is destructive and it is full of misery. And it will eventually crush any sense of pride you may have, if not in this life, certainly when you face the Creator having lived unto yourself. And we saw that. We saw that this young man's life left him with nothing. And so it, it crushed his pride. We looked at that last time. It, it softened his spirit, reflecting on where he'd come from, reflecting on his home, reflecting on the common grace that had come through a, through a patient father. Surely, surely he could look at his current circumstances living as he was living with nothing and he'd lost it all and, and no one is giving him anything. And 
And beyond that, Jesus unfolds the story with an economic crisis. There is a famine, and so he, he has no one that will ever offer him anything. The hope is gone. And in all of that crushing of his hope, against the backdrop of all of his misery comes the reflection. How, how sweet a memory to reflect upon his father and to reflect upon the kindness that his father shows toward even the slaves of his estate who worked the property as indentured servants. And he reflected on that and it not only had, not only had his circumstances crushed his pride, but but reflecting upon what he'd had before was used by God to soften him. And you remember that it worked repentance. He, he determined, the, script, the, the story goes, to go to his father and say to him, Father, I have sinned. He, he was going to face and embrace the shame. I'll get up and go to my father. He was going to come back through the village that he'd shamed and, and come to his family and the gate of the estate that he had disgraced and own it. He even said, I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. This is, this is an actual defiance that is quantifiable. It isn't ethereal. It isn't, it isn't something that is vague. It is a full weight of actual real guilt on me. And he said, I'll own it. And he also said that the consequences would be right and just. So he was in full-scale repentance in his heart even before he got up and left the pigsty. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I'm, I don't belong to the family. This is, as we saw, genuine repentance. This is the softening that, that gives access to the gospel. This is the very opposite of the hardened heart that will never have any hope in the gospel. I'm no longer worthy. There it is, right there. No sweeter words could ever come to a fallen heart than those words. I am no longer worthy. I can't climb to you, O God. It is just for you never to reach down to me. You are holy. You are completely separate from me. Get away from me, like Peter said when he was on the boat and he realized he was in the boat with God himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And he said, please get away from me. I'm an unbelieving man. I have a garbage life. Get away from me. I'm not worthy. And this shamed son even said, I'll go to my father and say, make me as one of your hired men. And the story would have brought to the unbelieving crowd, perhaps to some, a resonation with how they'd lived. Whether they were softened or not, we do not know, but we know that Jesus was about to take that lesson to the hardened Pharisees listening to the story because at this point, they would have imagined the story to end far different than Jesus unfolds it. They would have imagined the kid coming back in town as we saw and the village rejecting him and the estate rejecting him and the father not willing to see him. In fact, cut off, gone, buried, insofar as the family's recognition of him as any kind of connection with the family and its heritage. Gone, dead and buried. That would have been the assumption on the part of the Jewish leadership listening to the story. And so Jesus, if you remember, shocks them by saying that as the boy came up and got up to go to his father, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The father was longing to be merciful, waiting to be merciful, looking each day for the son. This is what Jesus is pointing out is the heart of God. You Jewish leaders have missed it. God loves to, to forgive. He longs to be reconciled with sinners. He does not wish that any would perish. This is the expression of the heart of God in Scripture. Sometimes we give up on, on sinners that we know. Sometimes we grow faint and weary in our prayers for those who are lost. God is always moving and where he is, as we just sang, the sovereign ruler, we trust his purposes. Because in the end, there will be no question about his justice. No sinner deserves God's mercy. And yet, shockingly, 
this father comes running. He simply can't wait to pour out mercy upon a broken heart. Moreover, he took the shame on himself. This is yet another gospel reality that Jesus is pointing to. He took the reproach upon himself. He, he did the most undignifying thing. He didn't sit in his estate and wait for something to be done and reparations to be made and for the son to earn a right to have an audience with the family. He ran through town, Jesus said. He saw him from far off. It must have been known throughout the village, at least in the minds of the hearers, that that this father was already doing strange things by waiting and longing, visibly looking. And then when he sees his son, he runs. A patriarch of a family going toward the disgraced son who had left and squandered it all. The shame that had come to his reputation, the shame that had come to the village, and he runs to the son willing to absorb the shame and the reproach. And Jesus portrays the father as doing things that only bring more shame and disgrace upon the father were human justice to be the rule. What does he do? Well, this is absolutely amazing. The son, verse 21, you saw last time, he, he says what he had planned to say. Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Repentance is now having itself manifested in front of his father whom he has disgraced. But before he can finish, verse 22, the father abruptly stops what his son is saying. His son can't even ask to be a hired servant before the father says to his other servants, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead. Did you note the language? This son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to celebrate. So here you, you go from this wonderful longing to be merciful to this actual forgiving and celebrating on the part of the Father. And the pardon here is extravagant. It is extravagant. And the symbolism here is, is rich as Jesus gives it. You notice how the Father is specifically calling for certain items, the best robe, a ring, and sandals. These have implications in the minds of the hearers. He did what? He's calling for the best robe. It was, of course, the, the finest, or, or the, the adjective here that describes it here is the, the robe of first importance, the robe of preeminence. This is the robe that was worn by the honored one in the position. This is of first rank. You put this robe on when you outranked everyone else. This is worn by the patriarch of the estate. And Jesus says, no, the patriarch of the estate puts it on the wretch. Now, the imagery is rich. We are to see extravagance here. All the servants in a story like this, the crowd would have known that all the servants understand that this is the chief robe and that it didn't get worn by just anyone at just any occasion. It was reserved for the most significant events, and it was worn only by the patriarch of the family or the highest guest of honor put in the highest place of honor. And the imagery is pretty contrasting. I mean, a, a boy from a distant land having been in a pigsty in the middle of a famine, and he comes back into the village, what does he look like? What does he smell like? This is a highly distinguished robe of honor. And this kid has just emerged from a long travel back home. And he would be as disgraceful on the outside as he has been on the inside. And the father tells his servants, get it, put it on him. He's worthy of the chief place of honor in our home. What? Moreover, not only is he worthy of honor, but he's worthy of the privileges that are given to one who belongs to the family. This, he says, bring him a ring. In the ancient setting, this would have been the, the family ring or a ring that symbolizes the boy's restoration to privilege. To put this ring on this son, the father is saying, this boy 
is and will always be my son with all the privileges that come with sonship. Some commentators believe that that Jesus also intends for us to imagine some sort of authority with that ring, some sort of signet ring. Jesus doesn't say that here, but it could very well be that he's restoring the son's place in making decisions on behalf of the estate. Now, this would have been mind-boggling to the crowd, let alone to the Jewish leaders. What? He's the one that took his inheritance, his part of it, and squandered his portion of it. And squandering it, it had a negative a severely negative impact on the financial strength of the family income for generations to come because that's how it worked. You took part of your inheritance as a child, a firstborn or a son, and you took it and you you sort of built up your family and its heritage, but interconnected it with the strength of the ongoing family for future generations. He squandered even all that. It would have severely debilitated, at least to some degree, some of the financial strength He has no right to manage any of the estate, and it may very well be that when the father put the ring back on him, he not only was restored to full privilege as a son, but maybe some integral interaction with the affairs of the family's future. So in in the father's very first sentence, he has declared his lost son to be worthy of highest honor and worthy of all the family privileges that would be naturally held by a son. Such grace, such mercy, such extravagant love. And he didn't stop there. He said he's also worthy of dignity. The sandals are called for. This is is such a tender thing in one sense. It is the father's way of covering the son's obvious destitution. Look, if you didn't have footwear in that kind of society, historians will tell you, if you didn't have footwear, you were either destitute or impoverished or you you were part of the servant's order on on an estate because you had to have somebody else's uh, support just to live. Either you were unskilled or you you didn't have opportunity, whatever the course may be. Slaves were always impoverished. They didn't have footwear. Reliable, lasting footwear was essential for your security. If you had them, people knew you were not impoverished. You weren't the lowest part of society. And this kid deserved nothing, should have had nothing, came into town with nothing. He was destitute, impoverished by his own doing. And the father says, bring his sandals. Get me the the things that restore his security. I'm going to cover over his destitution. The father restores his dignity. He's not impoverished. He's rich. This son is not the lowest of society, having to run around barefoot to signify that he's the low-level slave of someone else's resources. In fact, he's well-established. I want you to know that. I want everyone in the village to know he belongs to me, to a dignified family. He has the resources of a son of that family. He's worthy of dignity. Dignity. The Pharisees in the crowd would have thought he's worthy of disgrace and he's never done anything to earn that back. They would have been mystified. They'd be thinking, how can that father completely cover what that boy has done? And there's something inside of us that actually resonates with that question a little bit in our flesh. How can he say nothing? that would at least distance himself a little bit from the shame and the disgrace of this selfish, reckless boy. How can this father bear the boy's reproach and completely cover it up? How is it possible that he would not only pardon the fool, but restore him to his place as a son, and not just as a son, but a highly favored son? Listen, Jesus is putting his finger right on the central issue with those Jewish leaders. The heart of God toward a repentant, broken sinner is mercy. And if you don't think you need mercy, if you in your self-righteousness believe that you are there on your own, if you think you're good enough, better than other people, anything above, you think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, you are as far from the gospel as you could get. That is what Jesus is saying to them. 
In salvation, we are the miserable, utterly unworthy, and eternally outcast family members. Our creator made us, and we shame him. Our creator made us, and by our corrupt nature, we defy him. Our creator made us, and from our first breath, we do what we want to do. And then, because he's so gracious and patient, nothing happens to us for the longest time, and then all of a sudden some sense of earthly justice comes down and we reap the consequences of our sin, and we suddenly complain against God that the Creator has somehow been unjust. We are corrupt, absolutely corrupt. And yet, when life shatters that pride, when you see it as they ought to have seen it, and you come to God, and you bow down in humility and say, I'm not good enough. I will never be good enough. All my righteous deeds, all my thoughts that are the loftiest a human could have are as filthy garments in your presence. When you say that, and your arrogance has plunged you into enough ruin that you come to God broken and alone with nowhere else to turn. He runs to you in mercy. And he doesn't just say, okay, you're welcome back on the estate over there in a the shack. Or you can have the job of the lowest level galley servant until you have covered over some of your own disgrace. Oh no, I can't cover my disgrace. This son couldn't cover his disgrace. It is done. He is disgraced. But the father takes the shame upon himself, just like Jesus took our shame upon the cross and covered our sin as this father covered the sin of this shameful son. And he pardoned our guilt before we even expressed all of our repentance. We just came to God and, and in brokenness said, you're all I have and, and Christ has got to be my only hope. If he died for my sin, then I take it, I receive it. If he paid my penalty, what else do I have? You alone are eternal life. And all our guilt is covered in full. And if that weren't enough, look, if all I had was salvation, I've often thought of this, if all we had was salvation and from the time we were converted and our soul completely secure now for eternity and then God just left us here, didn't talk to us, didn't spend time with us, didn't call us into the family, didn't privilege us with security or protection, but we just had to live it out until we got to eternity, it would be enough, would it not? And yet, in this life, even after we come to Christ, we have too high of an opinion of ourselves. The same self-righteousness that keeps someone from the gospel still at times is there in our unredeemed humanity, and we don't think enough about what this Father has done. Because this is what Jesus says God has done with us. He's made us sons and daughters of the family, fully restored to honor, fully restored to privilege, fully restored to the dignity of his likeness in Christ. Oh, the forgiveness is extravagant. And then notice he, he launches an extraordinary party. <laughs> this is amazing. Verse 23, bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and he's been found. And they began to celebrate. The imagery here is so wonderful. This is the biggest feast. Uh, this was reserved for maybe a wedding feast of one of the boys or whatever. This is the fattened calf being prepared for some kind of feast and celebration in the future, and that would be enough to feed a village, so the village is invited. This is a lavish celebration. The whole village is invited. You remember in these parables, Jesus is saying, heaven rejoices over one sinner that repents. Here, the celebration is, is intended to convey extravagance 
This is why sometimes people call this the story of the prodigal God, because prodigal literally means extravagance without, without thought. So that's why we call the boy a prodigal, because the boy spent and squandered his living without thought, sort of reckless abandon is the idea. And so sometimes here now you have the father, ironically, being uh, the same with regard to all of his resources. He is in reckless abandon to celebrate the homecoming of this son. Jesus intends for us to know that when you came to Christ, that's what heaven did. That's what heaven does, celebrating. And heaven's in a constant celebration because somewhere on the globe, the Lord is saving, is he not? One day his grace will end and judgment will come. We've been studying that in the book of Revelation on Sunday nights. We will see that there are these divine drum rolls in the book of Revelation, and there's another one coming, even as we study it tonight, sort of a preparation for the, the worst announcement you could ever imagine, and that is that the grace is over, judgment is coming, and it will finish, and Christ will come, and then there will be no more redeemed people, only the ones that he have come to him in repentance and faith. It's a frightening aspect of the tribulation period, the finality of, of God's work in judgment before his son sets up his kingdom. But here you have this celebration intended for us to see the extravagance of God's grace and mercy against the backdrop of its opposite. Look, Misery in this young son turned to hope. Mercy came running to the young son. They began to celebrate. But listen, pride, listen, never celebrates grace. Mark it down. Pride never celebrates grace. The two do not coexist in the same heart. We certainly have moments of both but they are not the same. They are diametrically opposed to one another. Pride never celebrates grace because grace, grace does not exist in moments of pride. Verse 25. Now his older son was in the field and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. So the celebration couldn't wait. The older son, the firstborn, the, he should have known this would have been a, his celebration. If he had had a heart for his father and really loved the right things like his father loved, if the older son had embraced and imbibed the heart of his father when his younger brother left, then he would have been grieving and waiting with his father for his brother's return. But he is doing his dutiful business and the celebration just couldn't wait. It's already happening. And so it's probably a big piece of property intended by Jesus in the story. And the older son is not there to ask or to be a part yet. But notice he keeps his distance. Verse 26. He summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things might be. You, you understand. He approached the house, heard music and dancing, but he didn't rush to his father. He didn't boldly come into the courtyard with, with curiosity, with anticipation. He wasn't looking for his father and news of what's behind this wonderful gathering. No, not at all. What we begin to see here is that the, the sins of these boys... One is worse than the other. Foolish, reckless behavior in worldly living has brought one to ruin. The other is in far greater ruin. He just doesn't know it. He's in far greater ruin because his form of unbelief is spiritual unbelief. It's self-righteousness. He's full of his own importance. And this scene is already beginning to expose what's in his heart. Look, if there's a celebration of this magnitude, not only would I want to know about it, but I'd, I'd have been a part of the decision-making and integral to the relationship with the honored guest. This is what the boy is thinking. If you've got a celebration like this, I would already know about it. I'd be at the center of it. I'd be integral to how it is brought about and for whom the party is being given. 
You know, it's just an interesting thing to footnote when you think about this kind of pride. When you're full of your own importance, even the spontaneous joy and celebration of another person is cause for resentment. You ever notice that? When somebody's full of their own importance, you can't even enter into what is meaningful to someone else because it's taking away from your significance. You see it in little kids, you know, is it one of my grandson's birthday parties? You know what happens when they're really little. One is opening the presents and the other is stealing all the thunder. You know, they're opening it. They're announcing the gift before it comes out. They're blowing out the candles. They're doing all that. That's what we do by nature. Why? Significance. We have an uncrucified lust for significance. And if someone else breaks out into spontaneous celebration for something joyful that's happened to them, but we're wrapped up in our own significance, we can't celebrate with them. We can't enter into it like that. We're full of our own importance. That is this son. He keeps his distance. And he summons one of the servants. Why? Because, look, if a celebration is going on like this and I wasn't involved, well, somebody's got some explaining to do. He's not interested in why his father would put on such a marvelous banquet. I mean, how... How tragic the distance between the father's heart and this older son's heart. Man, you've been on the estate all your life and you don't even know the heart of your father? You must be resenting it all along. And what comes to the older boy is the greatest news of all. Verse 27, he said to him, this servant, your brother has come. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. This is the greatest news of all. If, if you understand God, what is involved here? Number one, a shattered life is restored. I get excited about that. Can't you? A shattered life is restored. Your selfish and your foolish brother has repented. That should be the greatest news at all. That should ring in this older brother's ears. If he loved his brother and he loved his father and he loved what's right and he loved his God, this would be his heart. Furthermore, to hear this news meant that this father, the beloved and gracious father, has lavishly forgiven him and fully restored him. Look, if your brother's back and they're already in a celebration, something marvelous has taken place. Restitution, acceptance, restoration, forgiveness. Aren't those the best things in life? I'll tell you what destroys is holding grudges, right? Love keeps no record of wrongs. Look, when you hold grudges, you resent somebody, you are keeping a record of wrongs. It is not love. You know what is the sweetest thing in, in relationships when there's love and forgiveness and restoration? There's nothing sweeter. We know that just by living in the image of God, we know that. We know the sweetness when someone forgives us of the things we've done against them. We know the precious freedom that comes to our conscience when we let go of our personal right to judge someone else and we forgive them. We know that. This is the greatest news of all. Your beloved father has forgiven him. That's why there's a celebration. You would think that that would thrill him. The whole village was invited to celebrate this astonishing thing. This must be of such a magnitude. He hasn't even seen his brother yet. He doesn't even know what has happened. But he knows the son has come back. His brother has come. Most of all, to hear this news would have immediately told the older brother, your younger brother, whom you'd lost to a life of, of distance and running away and taking what he wants and selfishness, which no doubt would have led to ruin. You can imagine it would have led to ruin. This brother you had lost on the road to destruction has, has come home. He's no longer on that road. It's the greatest news of all. Notice the last part of verse 27. He has received him back safe and sound. I like that. The, the servant who was asked the question gives the news that the father has received him back safe and sound. Sweet words they should have been to the brother. He's safe. 
But notice, he is more blind than a fool. He's more blind than his foolish brother. Verse 28, but he became angry. And he was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began entreating him. And he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I have been serving you and I've never neglected a command of yours and yet you have never given me a kid that I might be merry with my friends, indicating you've never even, you've never even uh, given me a feast with my friends with, with the least of what we have. And when this son of yours came who has devoured your wealth with harlots, you killed the fattened calf for him. Let me tell you something, beloved. This is in one statement, the heart of the Pharisees, the heart of the Jewish leaders, the heart of the spiritually proud, those that will never experience grace, here it is. And you can always tell by how they respond to the generosity of God. I had read it in Matthew 20. Oh, they were looking with evil upon the owner of the vineyard because he was generous. It would be like a disciple of Jesus who had been saved and redeemed and walked with him being resentful that he saved the thief on the cross in the late hour. It would be just as wicked. Notice, first of all, the self-righteous always hate mercy. He became angry and wasn't willing to go in. They always hate mercy. It reminds me of Jonah. <laughs> you know, God says, go to Nineveh, and I want you to call them to repentance. I want you to preach repentance to the whole city. Ninevites were a vile, vile people. God had chosen Jonah as his prophet to go. And what did Jonah say? He, he said, I don't want to go. You know why? Because I know that you are a gracious God and you'll save them and they're people that I, I don't think deserve it. I take your grace. In fact, I think that I might be more savable, more near grace, more deserving of grace, but certainly if anybody didn't deserve it, it's them. I'm, I'm not going. And you know what God had to do. He had to take him there by force, by fish. <laughs> and he did. And you know what? It's exactly how it happened. He preached in Nineveh and the whole city repented. The whole city. And Jonah was angry. See, I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> what in the world? Wow. You know, sometimes when I read things like that or I read about this brother, I, I, I sometimes on the one hand, think this, this is mystifying. How, how could you be angry at, at someone coming home? And then, and then I think, oh, there are, there's still so much of my own importance in my own heart that, yeah, when God is gracious to someone, I can resent it. Self-righteous hate mercy. He was angry. He wasn't willing to go in. They're also stubborn. His father came out and began to entreat him. You're kidding, right? The dad has to come out and entreat the oldest son? <laughs> that just tells you the self-righteous are stubborn. He was unwilling to go in, and his father had to come out and plead with him, and he still wouldn't go in. Just stubborn, hardened. And they trust in their own works. The self Here's their problem. Notice, for so many years, he said, I've been serving you. By the way, he didn't, he didn't give an endearing term either. He says, look. Almost as if to say, listen up, you. I mean, this is impersonal, disrespectful, but it reveals that he trusts in his own works. For so many years, I have been serving you. This is like every works religious system. When you come along and say, Jesus Christ will save you, but only by faith alone, you must trust in his works on your behalf. What does the person say? You're telling me that my works account for nothing? That's right. They account for nothing. But faith is everything. 
Faith is everything. I was talking to an unbeliever not long ago who said to me, so if someone has faith and trusts in their works a little bit, you're telling me that even their faith won't be accepted? I said, but it's not true faith at that point. Of course it won't be accepted. If you trust at all in your own righteousness rather than exclusively the righteousness of Christ to cover your sin, you cannot possibly know grace in the gospel. You can't. If you come out of a work system, whatever it may be, and you, in your heart of hearts, trusted Christ fully, and then you struggle with believing that, that's one thing. But if you come out of a work system and you've never actually ultimately and only trusted in the work of Christ on your behalf, not just his death, but his righteousness to cover your sin, if you brought anything of yourself to say, I, I think I deserved this, I think I'm better than that person, I think I'm better than I was, I can improve upon this, if you think that makes you acceptable to God, you have yet never known grace. This brother represents the self-righteous who trust in their own works. And when you trust in your own works, you gloss over your real guilt. Notice he does that too. I have never neglected a command of yours. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Now, he might be keeping some sort of record and you can't point to anything on the outside, but he is, he's not admitting a single thing on the inside. I have never neglected a command of yours. Listen, the self-righteous not only trust in their works, but they gloss over their own guilt. They deny their guilt. 1 John 1 says, if you say you have fellowship with him and yet you say you have not sinned, you lie and the truth is not in you. If you say you don't sin, then you say you've never sinned, you, you are not guilty, you've never been guilty, you, you can't know God. And the self-righteous live in a constant state of ungratefulness. Notice what he says, you've never given me a kid that I might celebrate with my friends. Just ungrateful. You have the whole thing to yourself. You're the firstborn. You have the privileges. That's what the father has to say to him. To say to him, son, verse 31, you've always been with me. All that is mine is yours. This, of course, is pointing to Israel, all the privilege of Israel to be the channel of the gospel to the nations. And all they did was take it to themselves. We're the special ones. Nobody else is as good as us. We're above everyone. We get to God on our own obedience to the law. This Jesus comes along and tells us we must believe in him. Are you kidding? We don't believe in him. Who, who is he? He doesn't acknowledge how good we are, how righteous we already are. And God is saying through this parable to Israel, you're ungrateful I've given you all these privileges and you've turned them into an occasion for self-importance. And so we note not only that the self-righteous are stubborn, not only they hate mercy, not only they trust in their own works or deny their own guilt or they're living in ungratefulness, but finally they cannot understand grace. Notice he says, when this son of yours came who has devoured your wealth with harlots, you killed the fattened calf for him. Exactly. Precisely. That is grace. That's right. Every one of us who knows Jesus Christ and knows his grace in the gospel understands grace. That is precisely what it is. I, I did squander you, Lord. I did squander everything you've ever given, everything you've ever said, everything you've ever done, everything up until the point where I met Christ. I'd squandered it all, lived for myself, offended you, and yet in Jesus Christ, he bore my guilt, he took my sin upon himself. The reproach that should fall on me fell on him. He willingly embraced my shame in order to kill the fattened calf for me and celebrate my coming, my sonship. That is grace. And this self-righteous brother was so far from the gospel, he didn't even understand any of that at all. And the father was so kind. Verse 32, we had to celebrate and rejoice. 
for this brother of yours. I mean, I love his terminology. He didn't just say this son of mine. He'd said that earlier this, through the servant. Here he says, this brother of yours, he's part of your family. What a kindness. He was dead. And he's begun to live and he was lost. And he's been found. Beloved, listen. The point of this is so rich. You know, I'm just reminded of so many times when the Pharisees missed it. Like in Luke 5, when Jesus was dining with Matthew and, and his ilk, giving them the gospel, and the Pharisees grumbled about it and said, oh, I see, you're not even willing to keep yourself distant from them because you're going to be defiled. Uh, we, we don't share with their kind because they'll defile us. I think of the self-righteous way that, that they stood with rocks in their hands over the woman in John 8. And by the law, indeed, her sin was stone worthy. She could have been put to death. But Jesus says to them in the crowd, which one of you has not sinned? Then you go ahead and cast the first stone. In other words, you're not above this woman. You're on equal ground. All of you sinners, all of you guilty before God. You're going to be her judge and her jury and sentence her? And they all tossed the stones aside and left because they all knew each other. I mean, if one of them had thrown a rock, the other would point. You, you can't throw that. They knew. And then what did Jesus say to her? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Walk with me. Be faithful now. I've saved you, redeemed you. I don't condemn you. That is grace. I'm reminded of Simon the Pharisee that we saw in Luke 7 when the woman came bursting in, the prostitute came bursting into the room and she just <clears throat> spills her, her ointment all over Jesus' feet and then, or all over his head and then weeps at his feet and wipes his feet with her hair, washing them with her tears. And what is Simon's response? Well, if Jesus knew what kind of woman this was, he wouldn't even, he wouldn't allow that. I don't even know what she's doing in this house. Totally missed the gospel. You know why? Jesus said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. You see this woman? Look, she is past all that shame. She's been forgiven. That's why she's loving this much. But he who's forgiven little loves little. You don't think you've been forgiven at all because you don't think you need it. And so you don't love like she loves. You resent me. If you're here today, don't miss what Jesus says here in this parable when he describes the older brother. Don't miss it. This is absolutely critical. This older brother represents the self-righteous heart that believes you're good enough, that you warrant something, that you deserve something. He is worse off than his foolish brother was when his brother left home. Both are sinners. One's life shattered him. The other, the kindness of God, wasn't enough to shatter his hard heart. God has compassion on the prodigal. And he is extravagant with his grace if you'll come in repentance and faith. But if you're full of the resentment or some sort of rising up of a stiffness in you to hear that your works aren't enough, you need to plead with God that he would show you. Just go back and read the account over and over again and watch what is said of the heart of God through this father and watch what is said of spiritual pride through this older brother. You can see that he's actually the one that is most distant from the heart of his father and most distant from the grace of the gospel. Bow with me. Lord Jesus, this is, this is a stunning parable that you gave and you are so infinitely powerful and wise with your words we could never exhaust the riches that are here but you have pierced us with it 
We're so full of ourselves. Even after we come to Christ, we tend in this direction in our flesh. Help us never to be self-important, self-absorbed. And Lord, may you redeem the self-righteous, even here in our midst, who've lived by their works all their life somehow, some way, hoping that it would be enough. May they see themselves in this older brother. And every prodigal in this room, every ruined life, may they see themselves in the younger brother in need of what he found. The emptying of himself, the crushing of his pride, the softening of his spirit, and the resolve to to come and plead for mercy, knowing that you'll do it. You're a merciful God. And so that's what we pray for, that the lessons would be driven home, O oh God. Help us to understand them rightly. Forgive us for any way in which we have defied these principles or denied them outright. And teach us your way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.